So uh, basically, the, the Space AL is all about getting to the moon, landing an unmanned, the first unmanned space, the first Israeli unmanned spacecraft on the lunar surface. So this is the mission. Uh, we hope to be next uh, after the United States and the Soviet Union. And very recently, uh, the Chinese landed on the moon, so I haven't been able to update the slide yet because it happens over the last two weeks or so. Uh, but we want to have the Israeli flag on the lunar surface, uh, and we want to do this uh, also to create what is called the Apollo effect. Today's kids, they don't want to be engineers. They, wanna, they don't want to be rocket scientists anymore. They want to be rock stars. They want to be celebrities. They want to be on national TV. Uh, in, in, you know, there are many shows uh, that shows them uh, how to behave, how to act, but they don't want to go and, and study engineering and science. And these are the things that are the core of, of making new things, of development. And we want to uh, move the spotlight towards that, those professions. And, and this is something that we're doing today, and I'll give a little more examples for that, is also inspiring today's kids to go ahead and pursue uh, science and, and engineering as careers. Uh, Sp Space IL is part of a competition called the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, this is uh, probably the most ambitious competition ever created. Uh, the competition's uh, goal is to land an unmanned spacecraft on the moon. Uh, the first prize for the team to do that is $20 million. Uh, there are extra uh, $10 million in uh, uh, prizes uh, and bonus prizes. For example, if you find water on the moon, you get a million dollars. If you find the American flag on the moon, you get a million dollars. If you find aliens, you get a million dollars. <laughs> aliens, not really. Uh, but this is an international competition that has uh, teams from all over the world, basically. Uh, and we're the only team from Israel. We're also the only not-for-profit team. This means that we're, not, we're, we're gonna give the $20 million back if we win, or when we win, we're gonna give it back to the community uh, for doing projects like this spacecraft. We're gonna do a next project that's gonna be ambitious and, and, and would ex expose kids to uh, what can technology do so that when they grow up, they can solve cancer or reach Mars or whatever they would like to do. Uh, we started it, uh, three founders, uh, Krieger, even myself. Uh, the idea came out in a bar. So we sat in the bar and we actually drew the first drawings of the spacecraft which still uh, carry us until today um, and it's, uh, it's quite a journey. It's been three years time. Uh, the project is actually uh, run and operated by a team of about 200 volunteers. There are about 200 people in Israel that build space jets on their space time, on their spare time. Uh, a lot of them, by the way, we got four people that actually did Aliyah from the United States and UK and came to work at Space IL. We got a, co a core team of about 12 people that are full-time dedicated to this project and this is their day job. But most, the majority of the work is being done by volunteers uh, doing this on their spare time. Uh, by the way, you can see here President Paris, if the lights were a little dimmer, you can see here President Paris, our number one volunteer, which also endorsed uh, this uh, uh, project about two years ago. So how do you get to the moon? So this is our spacecraft. Um, it's about this high, so it's about the uh, size of a washing machine. It's unmanned. A lot of people ask me if they can go uh, with the spacecraft or they want to send someone with the spacecraft to the moon. Uh, so you, you basically can't. It's too small. Uh, most of it is actually propellant. Uh, there is a very small uh, box here, which is the avionics or electronics. Uh, and we're using a lot of Israeli miniaturization technology to fit all the um, brains of the spacecraft into a very small box about this, about this size. Um, and you can see that the materialization that has ha happened in the last 40 years is helping us a lot. This phone that I hold here is actually more powerful than what NASA had in the Apollo times. Now, this is more powerful than what was in the entire NASA altogether in this phone. Today we're using this to, to do Candy Crush, but NASA could use it to get to the moon. <laughs> so uh, the journey is actually three steps. There are three simple steps three simple steps to get to the moon. The first step is getting out of the Earth's atmosphere. The second uh, is to travel the 380,000 kilometers, 380,000 kilometers all the way to the moon. And the third part, which is the most difficult one, is actually landing. And I want to share with you a little bit of how we do it. So buying a rocket to get to space is very, very expensive. We cannot afford it. It's a few hundred million dollars. But sharing a ride is very, very cheap. So let's say we got a rocket that was bought by a company, a commercial company, 
that launches its spacecraft to space already. Now, they have extra room in, those, in this rocket. We can actually share that extra room and, and, and actually install our, our spacecraft here. So we have to only pay for our, relevant, our relative share of the ride. We don't have to pay for the entire thing. And this is actually reduces cost a lot because we're about 100 kilograms. This guy here is about four tons. So you can figure out the math. It's, it's really, really cheap with respect to a, a complete rocket. Uh, and this is, we actually, we actually connected on, on a ring that's between the, the primary payload or the, the guy that pays a lot of the money and, uh, and the rocket itself. Uh, and this is how we get to space. Once we uh, get to space, our mission starts. So the spacecraft separated, separates itself from the launcher and we began the journey to the moon. The journey takes about two months or so. Uh, the reason it's so long because we don't, when, when you get a ride, you cannot be picky. So it won't get us all the way to the moon. It might get us to the moon, but the moon is not there because the timing is wrong. So we have to do a lot of, a lot of maneuvers uh, uh, to, to uh, synchronize our orbit with the moon itself. And that's actually the first time that's going to be attempted uh, to do such a maneuver. Uh, and so it takes about two months to get to the moon and perform the landing. Uh, and the landing itself, by the way, is the most difficult part of the mission. Uh, you got you to gotta imagine it. The spacecraft is traveling for about two kilometers per second towards the moon. Two kilometers per second, it's about eight times more faster than the Concorde uh, uh, supersonic uh, uh, airplane. So it's traveling very, very fast. It has to slow down to zero, from two kilometers per second to zero. If we miss by a bit, we're sure to switch on the moon. And it won't be a landing. It would be a, a, the flag will be there, but it's not going to be a landing. So we have, to, we have to be very, very careful in how we land. Now, parachutes would not work the, on the moon because there is no atmosphere. So parachute would not work. Airbags do not work at those speeds. So we have to use our own rockets to slow us down, and it has to work very precisely. Now, the frustrating part is once the engine starts, there's nothing we can do here on Earth to help it. We gave, us, we gave it our best engineering practice, our best simulations, but it's up to the spacecraft to do that. There is no joystick on Earth saying, go to the left, go to the right. The signal would take about a second and a half to go to the moon and, and another second and a half to go back. So we cannot control it from the moon. It has to do it by itself. So it's actually taking your baby, putting it into space, and hoping it could land on the moon. Now, we have to do a lot of tests and all the simulations, but there's nothing like landing on the moon. There's nothing we can do here on Earth like landing on the moon. So we're, we have to make it work for the first time. This is why we're working very hard today to make it happen. Uh, but this is the image that we want to that we want to send back to Earth. So what we want to do is that in 2015, at the end of 2015, the, sp the spacecraft will be launched. And once it's landed, we want to see the kids see it on TV, turning it from reality TV to reality on TV. So, by the way, this would run in parallel to Dancing with the Stars 20 and... Uh, <laughs> but we want to give an alternative to those kids. Uh, by the way, today kids are already escorting the projects and they can see the evolution of the technology as it grows. Because in, 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 those, in, in this instant uh, uh, culture that we are at, we're building the spacecraft for the next episode we're landing, here no. They know it's going to take several years. It knows it, it is gone already three years, and another two years are about to come. So they know that it's a long process, and they can share the process itself. Uh, we're already influencing kids today. Now, I'll give a disclaimer. These two are my younger brothers. But still, you can see how much enthusiasm uh, a kid in garden can get from a, car, uh, from a, a piece of carbon uh, uh, folded in the right way. Now, kids, you know, there are two types of kids, by the way. That we, we do this a lot with kids. And uh, there's two types of kids, the ones that uh, uh, we ask them to draw inside the, the spacecraft what they would take to the moon with them. And there are two types of kids. Uh, one type is going to say, I'm going to take my teddy bear and uh, a bottle of water. And there's another type with, with, of kids which is very concrete. I'm going to take a rocket back and a, 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 an oxygen for myself and so on and so forth. So they're already thinking about this. By the way, kids send us. Uh, their ideas of how we, uh, how we should build a spacecraft. Now, a bunch of those ideas are pretty good. Uh, and, uh, but, and we, of course, we publish them all and get, uh, the kids get credit for what they do. 
Um, so we're very involved in the community. And by the way, you can also take part of the spacecraft if you uh, shoot this uh, QR code. Uh, it will take you to a link where you can upload it, your picture. Now, the picture is going to go in a database that will fly with the spacecraft. So you're basically going to have your, your, your face on the moon uh, in three years' time. So uh, uh, I encourage you to do that. If, if you don't have your phones with you, go online to our Facebook page, and uh, you can do it yourself. Uh, I would like also to share uh, a, a small story that I have uh, with relates to that uh, uh, space IL. For me, it's a great honor standing on this stage because it's kind of a closure of a loop. Uh, my journey started about 12 years ago when I was 15. I was competing in a competition called the Young Scientists Competition that uh, the museum holds every year. Um, and that uh, uh, competition is for, invent uh, for inventors, for young inventors to come and present their projects and why they did that. And also there's prizes and the president gives them. Uh, and when I was 15, it's what, that was the first time that I uh, attempted to do something like that. And I came here and I got all the way to the finals. So actually. Uh, was in this room when they announced the finals. But unfortunately, I did not win. So, and, and my take home message was, okay, you don't, you don't win the first time. So I tried again at the age of 16 with a different project, did it all over again, uh, did another project, uh, uh, and also got to the finals. I was sitting in the audience and say, okay, this is gonna be it. And I didn't want it. So I did it again. And I got here again, and by the way, uh, uh, one of the managers at that time told me that you're either going to win a prize this year or we're going to give you a prize for persistence. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, luckily for me, I won it, and I also flew to, uh, to represent Israel in, in Europe in the European competition, which I didn't want. But uh, the take home message from this, and this is uh, uh, creativity to me, is that there is always a way. You don't take no for an answer. There is always a way. And if you're persistent enough and you do it well and you learn from your mistakes, you will not get it the first time, but you will get it in the third time. Uh, so I can tell you that there are many people that, when we founded Space IL three years ago, there were many, many people that would say, it would not work, you're wasting your time, uh, nobody would sponsor this, uh, technology is immature, it would, what just would not work. And for me, taking those people and, and hearing it over and over again, the third time it would work. And this is why uh, uh, I'm very proud that today, three years later, there are a lot more people that think that it would work than, than people that think that it wouldn't. Um, and this is, goes all the way to technology and to kids and, and to uh, uh, financing and so on and so forth. So for me, creativity is actually making something work by not accepting a no for an answer. Thank you very much.